always have to know what screen did it pick? Are you seeing main monitor one? Yes, lovely. Yeah. So you actually see a single slide, right? Yep. Versus the plethora of additional windows that I'm going to use for my presentation. Good. Looks All right. Good. Well, thank you for joining me. Um, I see we kind of have a small to medium group, which I prefer. Um, oh, we're up to 200 people, so not so small a group. <laughs> That's okay. When you're on a, a, a webinar, there could be one person or 10,000 people. Um, you all look the same to me. <laughs> all right, that was supposed to be a joke. Let's get going. All right, so I am a senior consultant with Pragmatic Works. I've been with the company for a little over two years now, and I work mostly in we basically have three pipelines at Pragmatic Works. Is this is how I think of it? I mostly work in services, but I also teach our analysis services master's class, so I do a little bit of training as well. And we all sell products, <laughs> of course. Uh, my favorites are Task Factory and BI Express, um, and I would have said that prior to becoming a Pragmatic Works employee. All right, so here's a little bit of personal information about myself. I'm Jay's wife. I'm Nate's mom. I have a few certifications. When I'm not in front of a computer, I like to take my camera and uh, go outside and enjoy God's uh, green earth. My preferences are southern Utah and northern Arizona. Um, but I like to show this slide because I just want you to know that um, it is tough to get a job with Pragmatic Works, but we all really are just normal people. <laughs> um, but we uh, have an attitude of service, and we also have a requirement to be fairly well versed in all aspects of the Microsoft BI tool stack. Um, but today we're talking about specifically about Salesforce. So first, let me tell you what the session will not be about. And don't drop off on me, okay? I'm up to 226 people. <laughs> so after this slide, I better not see 198. Um, this is not a lesson on dimensions and facts, okay? I'm also not going to uh, beat on you about transactional processing versus analytical processing and analytics. This is not an introduction to Salesforce. Um, I'm not a Salesforce salesperson. In fact, I rarely work through the Salesforce graphical user interface. What I have done, however, is at least four uh, client engagements where I have pulled Salesforce data into a data warehouse for reporting and analytics. And that really is what this session is about. But I'm not going to teach you about Salesforce itself. Um, I'm also not going to spend time on showing you really cool reporting visualizations using Salesforce data. And why is that? Because on my four engagements, I'm going to tell you what all four companies had in common. Opportunity and account. <laughs> Period. <laughs> End of story. Salesforce allows for so much customization, honestly, um, that for me to start putting up reporting services visualizations and Power BI visualizations with Salesforce data would not be applicable across the board unless I stayed with those two tables that everybody does use, opportunity and account. So we're not going to talk about pretty pictures today, but we are going to talk a lot about how you can get a good visualization from your Salesforce data uh, using some, some tips and some uh, best practices. So we are going to spend time today talking about what I call a BI blueprint. If you have attended any of my other webinars or you've had me on site for an engagement, you know about the BI blueprint because I start every um, a SQL Saturday presentation talking about the blueprint and pretty much every engagement. We are going to spend a considerable amount of time talking about the semantic layer. We will talk about the data model. We're going to spend quite a bit of time talking about extracting Salesforce data effectively. And then I do have some recommendations for you at the end. All right, so Dolores' favorite slide number one is, you know, what's at the center of your wheel? Um, whenever I, I've, I've been a consultant now traveling road warrior for over six years, and I'm asked a lot, you know, every place I go, what should I do? What are my best options for, you know, X? And you know what? I have a pretty standard answer, and I'm going to give it to you right here, and you can save a lot of money then, right? <laughs> I'm going to add, tell you in return what's best for reporting and analytics. And I actually first drew up this wheel when I was on 
a six million dollar engagement where ETL was the center of the wheel. So we all learn um, by either our own mistakes or others' mistakes. And from that engagement, I I drew this picture because that was um, that was a real eye opener. When ETL is the center of your wheel, that should not be the center of your BI program any more than your data model or whether you're using MPP or SMP. It's always what's best for reporting and analytics. So I just want to put that right out on the table so you know where I'm coming from. And, um, you know, so a lot of my opinions from here on out to the end of the hour is, is going to be based on what's best for reporting and analytics. It will not be based on fastest ETL. It will not be based on cheapest hardware. It will not be based on a bunch of other things. It's all about reporting and analytics because in the end, we aren't doing all this just so we can have a backup and recovery system, right? I think we would agree with that. So when you have a BI program, I like to think of it as a house. And today, we're actually talking about our foundation, transforming and loading Salesforce data primarily. Um, we're going to see what happens when you give up your BI house and you simply put a, um, a roof on top of, um, I guess you have to put a roof on top of sticks, right? <laughs> but when you don't have a data warehouse, you don't have a semantic layer, you don't have an SSRS web portal, you might have a BI service, but, but what happens when you start cutting pieces out of your house? Because Salesforce, as you know, is just a small part of your business. Um, I have it represented here at the bottom. I have a little of um, a two by four that says Salesforce. But you also have budgets. You have advanced planning systems. You have enterprise resource planning systems. You have human resources. You have data coming from Excel. How are you going to pull those all together? And I do respect that Microsoft is uh, creating in many of their tools, including Power BI and Excel, the ability to mash up data. But let's talk about that. Because when you have a BI house, if we think of it as a house, what's the first thing you need before you build a house? You need a blueprint. Uh, I did tuck a little slide in here just, in, just to give you a little background of uh, you know, what we're after with our BI house. What do we want our return on investment to be? Because I realize that I'm not going to take this BI house and come into your place of business and say, you have to look this way. Your house was, you has to look like um, the next guy's house. That's, that's absurd, right? Your house is going to be unique to your company. But there are some things that we all have in common, right? There is a reason I'm recommending a data warehouse at the bottom and then a series of views and a semantic layer sitting underneath my SSRS web portal or my Power BI service. And why am I recommending those things to you? Because we want at least, we're after these six return on investments. We all want this. We first, we have to have data integrity. Now, tab tabular models are a little bit more forgiving, but if you work with multidimensional, you're going to be guaranteed some data integrity because your cube won't process without it. <laughs> it's one of the challenges of multidimensional cubes. Uh, we definitely want scalability, um, which is why I recommend to you that you have a layer of views um, and not go directly to your tables, even with your semantic layer. Um, I have a couple of questions for you, just so you know how my, how my mind is running along these lines. If we go back to data integrity for a minute, if you have a plethora of reporting services and Power BI reports that integrate data, which I realize is a big sales pitch by Microsoft, I'm just, I just want you to tell me, and I wish we could actually sit down across the table and have a conversation. Um, how are you going to maintain data integrity? For design scalability, if these same reports have their own relationships, subqueries, and definition of net. I'm just using that as of an example, okay? Um, but you get the idea. How are you going to be positioned for future business growth? As far as optimized query performance, if you give up your semantic layer, which is where your pre-processed totals for multidimensional cubes and in-memory capabilities for tabular models comes in, I just, you know, let's just talk about it. Um, how long do you want to wait for a report to instantiate? I'm going to show you a Power BI report in a couple slides. It takes 20 minutes to refresh. It's an example of what not to do. And I also want you to know anything that I show you in this next hour that is an example of what to not to do. 
did not come from a client because I would never do that. I'm actually picking on our own internal Pragmatic Works Salesforce reporting, <laughs> and I feel like I can do that. <laughs> Let's talk about uncluttered graphical user interface. If you take all 200 plus Salesforce opportunity columns, we actually have over 250 because you know how you can add all kinds of custom columns in every table? So we have over 250 Salesforce opportunities. And you present them all in a single tabular table. Talk to me about how you define the word uncluttered. <laughs> I'm going to show you that Power BI report in just a moment where you're going to actually see that. Let's talk a little bit about maintainability. If we would use nested views instead of that semantic layer, um, I actually spent four hours about a month ago trying to find a problem with the Salesforce report, and I had to trace down at least six uh, nested view layers. And let's talk about security. Um, everyone has different security requirements, and I, and I do respect that. But if you're coming from a larger company, chances are you do want to lock down um, your Salesforce opportunities uh, by region or department or by person, right? And a, most, well, I'm not gonna, I, I hesitate to use the word easy, but a very typical way of doing that is through your tabular models and semantic layer. Um, granted, they're all, there's all sorts of creative alternatives for that, right? But just that's our, that's our easy win. That's our low-hanging fruit there. All right, so moving on, talking about our BI house, let's get to our BI blueprint. Um, I just wanted to explain my house layers for just a minute before I talked about a blueprint. This is not your blueprint. This uh, blueprint actually originated when I was at Hewlett Packard, and I brought it with me. Uh, whenever I go into an engagement, this is just a starting place. I have this in Visio, and I totally rearrange it for every client I'm at. The point. The only point on this slide is that for everything, there is an appropriate place. All right, so I don't have data integration in column four, six, and eight. And I certainly don't want to see a data integration in column nine. All right, so all I'm saying is for everything, there is an appropriate place. I would encourage you to take Take this picture, and if you email me, I'm happy to send you the Visio sitting behind here so you don't have to recreate all of these structures. Make your own blueprint. Where is the appropriate place for data integration at your company? Where is the appropriate place for a data warehouse? Do you even need one? So it's different for everyone, but this is just a starting place. When we talk about Salesforce specifically, I feel that the, this is a pretty good BI blueprint, what I have in front of you. I don't feel like I need uh, pipes five and six. The reason being, those are Inman style data warehouses, which really kind of smack of a third normal form. And I only put them in, I'm just gonna go back a slide a minute so you can remember what I'm talking about. I only put in uh, pipes five and six, only when I have a master data, ma data management problem. And or when my, um, when my pipe one or my column one has a, just a a hodgepodge of sources, you know? Um, but then I usually have a master data MDM problem where I have customers coming from multiple sources and somehow I need to get that all put, pulled together. The easiest way to do that is often by dumping it into a third normal form. And then column seven is where it actually becomes a model optimized for analytics. And that's much different than what you're gonna see in five and six. That model in five okay, is optimized for data integration. I want a model optimized for analytics and reporting, and you get that in column seven. So I feel this is a fairly reasonable uh, BI blueprint, and this is actually what we're going to work off today. So for in this session, we're actually going to take a deep dive into two, seven, and eight, all right? Let's start with our semantic layer, okay? That's column eight. What happens when I don't have a semantic layer and I just use views, okay? You can do that, right? I'm not trying to uh, push you into my mold <laughs> uh, for BI programs, but let's just talk about, I'm just trying to show you some experience of what happens if I take out the semantic layer. It is absolutely possible. A semantic layer is, ab is not required in a BI program, all right? 
Well, this is what happens if you don't have a semantic layer when you're reporting from Salesforce. This is an actual Power BI report. Just in case you don't believe me, I opened it. <laughs> I actually had to do quite a lot of work to get all these into one screenshot for you. <laughs> but here they are. And this is an actual Power BI report that is actually refreshing every single day. And it takes about 30 minutes. And you can see, you can start to guess why. Just minimize this. Um, I have no semantic layer. So consequently, I have a series of views that I'm working with. Let me tell you that at least four of these boxes that you see sitting here have a view system that looks like this. All right. So um, I, I I want to be careful on these. These are, this is an actual pragmatic works report, so I feel like I can be a little hard on us or internally, and I know why um, this Power BI report ended up looking like this, okay? For everything there is an appropriate place, and for everything that isn't perfect, uh, perfect in your BI program, there's probably a reason, all right? And there's a reason, and a pretty good reason that's sitting behind um, this particular view. My parent view is utilization over here on the left, but in order to get utilization, all of these views have to fire. And notice something that we all know is, is a bad thing. I'm actually calling a single view more than one time. So I have no semantic layer, so I'm just trying to do the best with what I have. And this is unfortunately the result of that. Let me show you something else that happens when you don't have a semantic layer. This is a an example of some T-SQL inside of one of those views. And working with Salesforce, this is very applicable. You want to know day since last task, days to next task, uh, how many days since last activity date, how many days to the next activity date. So these are all reasonable analytic questions, but it's sitting in a view. All right, and this is partly why that report takes so long to refresh. Not just there are nested views, but those views are doing business logic that if we look at our BI uh, blueprint, where does, where does this kind of ETL work, this, these transforms belong? Probably in my ETL system, right, and not in my view. You can put them in a view as a last resort, and that's what we've done, because there's a reason that they're in here, but this isn't a first choice. Let me show you what else is happening without a semantic layer. I have 75 DEX calculations for Salesforce opportunity alone. Alone. <laughs> okay. I'm not even talking about DEX calculations that are in other fact tables. Um, and all these DEX calculations are unique to one PBIX, so one Power BI report. Consequently, there's no sharing of business logic to another PBI report, or even an SSRS report. All of these stat calculations would have to be um, recreated, all right? Because I don't have that semantic layer, which is where these really belong. Because then I could have multiple part BI reports picking up and using the same business logic and producing the same number. But right now I have 75 data calcs that are in one PBIX file. So in effect, with I, on the previous screen prints, I not only don't have a data warehouse, but I don't have a semantic layer either. I'm going, pretty much what's happening is I'm going from stage re to reporting. Um, honestly, I don't think that this is that uncommon. I have been in many companies that I see this exact scenario. And a lot of reasons is, is because you know, you see Power BI, you can download it for free. Um, you really can say, okay, you can connect to a plethora of data sources. Salesforce is just one. You can mash up data and you can give business value practically overnight. And that is a lot of the sales pitch for Power BI. And I'm not saying, I mean, that it works, but it doesn't work well if you're trying to achieve our, our six return on investments. If you put in that, that data warehouse and that semantic layer, you're going to achieve then what? The data integrity, the performance, the security, um, all of these things that we're, 
we're trying to get from our BI program. It's not just about reporting. Can, can we agree on that <laughs> for just a moment? Um, you might have started this way, right, just to prove something, a proof of concept, you know. Uh, Pragmatic Works gets calls quite a bit on people who are just starting their BI programs. They, they don't have a data warehouse and they need help with ETL and they ask us to come in and we actually create a blueprint for them and we help them get started. Um, but to sell that, you know, a lot of times this blueprint, what you see in front of you, is what you need to actually sell a concept and I understand that. I want to be clear when we look at this too that this is a blueprint. It might not be the blueprint that we all want, but it is still a blueprint, agreed. I have data, source data going from source data to reporting. And that's a blueprint. And this is actually how I have built my BI house um, with my current PBAX reports that I just showed you. So I might not like it, but the, there are benefits to this too. And I think um, you know, doing just a proof of concept, you'll see this quite a bit. But this isn't something that you want to live with forever, right? Because it certainly is not scalable by any stretch of the imagination. All right, so for everything in appropriate place, this is where we want to be in the end. We want to have things pulled into a, a cleaned uh, data warehouse. I don't have garbage in column seven. I've got all kinds of things in column three. I've got everything cleaned up in column seven. I have it modeled for analytics. And if possible, not a requirement, but a huge benefit if I could put a semantic layer in column eight. Now, I was at a company that did not want to use SSAS. I respect that. But, you know, I really liked what this, what this lady came up with, and I have stolen this phrase from her, certified data sets. <laughs> if I get an email from her after this call, that, that will be interesting. I've taken her phrase, certified data sets. Uh, she might not have originated it, but I learned it from her. They don't have time to do an SSAS model. So what she has done is created views and has called them certified data sets. I really don't have a problem with that because it's actually very structured and it's very planned. Okay, it's not a list of nested views uh, to infinity and beyond. Okay, that's not what these certified data sets are about. But they actually are, you know, kind of approved, scrubbed, uh, denormalized data sets that they're using for reporting. And that's actually going to work very well with her um, and for her company, which is, is quite large and she has quite a bit of demand. So um, I advocate a semantic layer, but I'm just now I'm talking you out of it because I'm going to tell you there are people that don't have it and how that they have effectively managed without it. All right, so our BI program, I think I've harped on you enough about this. <laughs> Integrity, scalability, query performance. Um, I put this slide up again, though, because I want to bring something to your attention. What is not on this list? Notice I do not have cool report features. I do not have nifty visualizations. I do not have self-service business intelligence. And I don't include those on purpose. Because to me, this is a list of my critical success points. If I, do these six, if I focus on these six things as my return on investment, I'm going to get great reporting, cool visualizations, and self-service BI is a byproduct. But that's not what I'm going for first. I want data integrity first and scalability and performance, maintenance, and security. And when I have those things, I am guaranteed that I can give my user some pretty cool report, report features and honestly pick something. I like reporting services. I'm a Microsoft girl. I like Power BI, but I'm going to be honest with you. I really like Tableau. <laughs> All right, um, so again, I'm not taking the Microsoft tool stack and smacking you over the head with it. You can do visualizations from a lot of vendors, all right? But all these vendors, you're going to be much happier uh, with their output and how they're functioning if you have focused on these six things for your BI program. All right, enough said about the semantic layer. Let's talk about the data model because I only have 30 minutes left. So, as I shared at the top of the hour, um, I've gone into several companies that use Salesforce as a source, Pragmatic Works even being one of them. Um, and honestly, they only have a few tables in common. Um, every company that I've gone into has really expanded their opportunity table. They've added a different, co more columns to their account table, to their tasks table. They have created all kinds of custom tables. 
If you've worked with Salesforce data, you can recognize these because columns are an underscore, underscore, lowercase c, and custom tables in the source will be an underscore, underscore, lowercase c, as for custom. So because of that, I'm not going to give you an, e an ERD, an OLAP ERD for Salesforce, all right? I can't really do that. Um, but I will give you some tips that will be applicable uh, mostly to opportunity and account and some of those tables that seem to be universal. One of the first things is when working with Salesforce, um, is it uses 18 character string keys. Are you with me on this? And this absolutely kills my cardinality. Because with tabular models and Excel especially, cardinality is key you will die on that hill, <laughs> all right? For those of you not familiar uh, with cardinality, my definition of that is simply the number of times a single value repeats in a call, all right? So sales order status would have a high cardinality because I probably only have three or four of them. Sales order number would have a low cardinality because every single one, well, let's forget about sales order line right now. Let's talk about sales order header. Every order is, is unique, all right? I can't compress that, all right? Um, think of column store indexing, uh, you know, for example, that um, is going to put things in columns instead of rows. We've all seen, hopefully, some visualizations of that. Um, you will see a form of that, right, sitting behind Excel and um, certainly analysis services. When you have high cardinality like this, your you're going to, to pay the price for that, both in compression and in file size of your tabular models and Excel workbooks. So let's solve that problem in our data model. Now, if you've done data warehousing prior, if you're a little bit familiar with it, you're going to be like, of course we would do this, Delora. Are you nuts? <laughs> Basically, a best practice of data warehousing is but the first thing we do is what? We don't use our source business keys as our data warehouse keys. I don't think that's new to most people who work with data warehousing. So by default, you're going to solve this problem, all right, in your data model already, just because this is what you're used to doing. You're going to take this business key, which is this horrendous 18 character string key, and you're going to replace it with a nice, beautiful integer key. And yes, you can make the point to me, Delora, your cardinality is the same, and you're absolutely correct, it is. But this is what's key, is that analysis services and Excel compresses numeric integer keys much better than string keys. And that's pretty much the beginning, end of the story. So for best query performance, memory usage and in-memory PBIX or XLSX file size, it is absolutely critical that string keys get replaced with integer keys during your ETL. So not a difficult thing to do, often a very typical thing to do in a data warehouse and an ETL system. I'm just bringing to your attention that in Salesforce, it needs to be a non-negotiable. You can bring this business key into your data warehouse, right? You, you need it because you have to know if something has been updated, changed, or whatever. You need it for the ETL system. But what you don't want to do is expose this, if at all possible, in your tabular models, multidimensional cubes, or Excel. I mean, you can. I know it's business keys are how you trace back to the source. But if, there, if you can actually um, give your users a link to an SSRS report or some other way to give them those business keys, that is certainly uh, the better idea here. Because if you don't do that, I actually um, stole this from Rachel Martino, uh, who used to be with Primatic Works, and with her permission, she's allowed me to use her screen print. And while we're talking about this, I do want to show you something. I have this little blog site if you want more information on um, Rachel's SQL Saturday, or what I'm about to talk about for the next five minutes, you will actually find it here at DeloraBradish.com. Just search for Salesforce, and the same information is given here with a, li a little bit more detail. All right, so this is the skinny, all right? When she replaced her string characters, you see this ID? That was a string character. You see this memory size? When she replaced that with an integer, look what happened. Okay, significant improvement. I'm going to leave it at that, but I wanted to give you a real life, you know, 
get, get your hands in, in the batter to actually see um, that what I'm talking about is, is, up, is true and you really do want to pay attention to it. So my data modeling tip number one um, is think about cardinality, replace with integer keys. Number three, you're going to get better compression in tabular models and also in Excel, and you're going to see your maximum file sizes, well, they're going, well your maximum file size, your file size itself will, will decrease because there are maximum file sizes both in Power BI and in Excel. All right, I'm going to leave it to you to do additional research. You can actually download my PowerPoint um, from Pragmatic Works and I give you lots of links if you want to uh, dig into this a little deeper for yourself. Number five for data model critical success points is we're going to talk about performance and to me pushing your calculations back to the ETL is not about Salesforce, it's about best practices for data warehousing hands down. Let me encourage you strongly, don't sacrifice your query performance on the altar of MDX and DAX. Just because we can doesn't mean we should use MDX and DAX. They have their appropriate place, right? For everything, there's an appropriate place, and that includes MDX and DAX. I personally can't live without it, but it's not my go-to place when I want to resolve a business problem. That's back in my model and my ETL. Last, Rapture, my critical success points for Salesforce is that unclutter graphical user interface. Again, um, remove unneeded columns from SSAS. I definitely would still pull them into my data warehouse. They're not hurting anything by sitting there. But one other tip for unclutter graphical user interface, let's talk about opportunity. In my case, it has over 250 columns. Let's look at Power BI. And I'm not showing you these reports because there's real data and I want to keep my job. <laughs> all right, so if we look at opportunity though that has 250 columns. If I expose them all in Power BI, it just becomes very cluttered. And what is happening here is I not only have dimensions under one header, I also have facts. I have calculations that are coming in from my source and I have DAX calculations that are unique to my PBIX file. And to me, this is just a giant mess, right? So um, let's take our opportunity. This is just a suggestion, okay? And split it into a dimension and a fact with a one-to-one -one relationship. That's just a suggestion to make things a little bit less uncluttered. All right, let's get moving into data extraction. Um, I have 20 minutes left, and believe it or not, this is actually um, what started my webinar. <laughs> um, I was asked to do quite a bit of research for a client on Salesforce data extraction. And some of these slides are, are from that engagement, and actually uh, the other slides actually built on top of this. So let's spend some time here. Um, first of all, you need to know um, that we had a requirement. Basically, um, I was only asked to look for solutions that were compatible with SQL Server integration services data flows. That eliminated these seven vendors. I'm putting them up here though because if you don't have this requirement and you want to look at all your Salesforce extract options, you might want to look at these seven people. All right, but we had an SSIS requirement, and these are basically third-party standalone uh, options that push data in and out of Salesforce, and we wanted to use integration services. So we did do a significant deep dive into these seven vendors. Basically, things washed out this way. You were an ODBC driver, you were an OLADB provider, or you were an SSIS component. All right, all of these seven people wash into one of those three categories. Um, let's first talk about uh, methodology. That was the first thing we evaluated. We actually evaluated all seven of these things, but I'm going to talk to you today about one and three, because that was the uh, decision-making paradigm. Well, this is what it all boiled down to. Methodology and incremental load execution times. I did not um, document customer support, even though that was the course evaluated. Um, I talked with actually all of these vendors, uh, did some one-on-one -on -one with them. I didn't have any bad customer support, truthfully. 
I will say that Task Factory, though, if you go to uh, Task Factory at the Permatic Works website, you're actually going to get a pop-up and uh, an instant message, basically, how may we help you? And believe it or not, there's actually somebody behind that pop-up. <laughs> when I have questions at a, a client, I always go there and I, and I talk to our Task Factory people directly and immediately. But I did not uh, evaluate customers customer support, so I'm not going to talk about that or compare vendors on customer support, neither on dependability or on security requirements. We're going to focus on methodology and incremental load times. So let's talk about methodology. If you use an SSAS component, you have a real advantage because you're just going from Salesforce right in um, to SSIS, and SSIS isn't taking and pushing your data into your data warehouse. Life is so simple. Okay, but there are options, and maybe one of these other options will work best for you. There's an OADB driver vendor. Um, that gave us two options. I could use that OADB drivers uh, directly in SSIS and still go straight from Salesforce to SSIS, or I could actually go the link server route. And you can see that ODBC and link server also had their methodologies, or basically their way to get from source to destination. Now, before I move off this slide, and you totally throw out the link server idea, pause. <laughs> All right, just pause for a minute, just for your own amazement and amusement. Um, there are advantages, okay? So don't overlook them. For instance, is their ability to perform functions in a view, like a substring, or a null if. Um, keeping in mind, however, you had to conform to open query syntax. That can be a little challenging, but it's doable. You gain the ability to switch out drivers um, without impacting your SSIS packages. And a third advantage would be the ability to use a 64-bit system DSN. Oddly, SSIS only recognizes 64-bit user DSNs. Okay, it, rec it recognizes 32-bit system and user DSNs, but only 64-bit user. I'm not quite sure why that is, but that's the way it currently works. There's definitely some disadvantages, though. Um, performance. <laughs> it's painful for me to even say it, but I have some actual numbers for you to look at in the next slide. Also, having to use open query can be a bit challenging. Um, it also will be necessary to maintain a SQL view. Okay, so, so nothing is free, but don't throw out the link server idea completely. It's not my recommendation way when we get to the last slide in the slide deck, but you know what? Let's throw it on the table and at least have a conversation about it. All right, so back to methodology. When we work with an SSIS built-in component, and remember, let's go back quickly, who has those? I get those from Pragmatic Works Tax Task Factory, and I also get that from, from C Data. Both of these vendors offer an SSIS source. Okay, so those two vendors are going to allow you to do something like this. Now I'm guilty of watching a little bit too much food TV, and I like Ina Garten myself, and I love it when she says, "How easy is that?" <laughs> All right. When I look at this, that's all I can say. How easy is that? <laughs> all right? I go right from source. I have an upsert. I go right into my destination. Sweet. Sweet. All right. But maybe that's not an option for me. All right? In which case, and what's not an option here, I'm going to focus right now on this upsert. All right? If I don't have that upsert, I've got a couple things going on. First of all, I have a data flow that uses, in this case, I use the Zimba ODBC driver, which actually gives you the best performance. I have a table for that, so you can see everybody compare it in just a minute. But without an upsert, I have to push everything through a lookup. See this here? And if I have no match, I do an insert immediately. And if I have a match, that tells me I have an update, right? Well, what do I do with it? Because I can't run an update statement with SSIS capabilities the way that they are packaged out of the box. So generally, that means I'm doing a second insert, but I'm doing that into a SQL table that is identical 
to another table but I, that I use just for my updates. So I push that into a table that says this is, these are values that need to be updated. And then I run some sort of T-SQL. And that is my, that's my execute SQL task right here. All right. So now I have a data flow that has some very usable working uh, tasks. Okay, it's not simple like my first slide where I have a source and an upsert destination and I move on and get more things done. I have a lookup and I have an insert and I have a second insert and now I actually have an update. But this does work. I have to say it actually works quite well. Um, but it just isn't as simple as the first option. But it is a possibility. All right. So let's talk about execution times now. I'm not showing you my numbers right out of the gate because I want you to read that first sentence if you would be so kind. It's strongly recommended. I should have double underlined that. To run these same tests in a UAT environment because I ran these from my local laptop so, and from an actual production Salesforce environment. So I was had some record locking going on and I had to contend with a local internet service provider. So those are my two disclaimers, all right? When you run these same tests, if you're interested, I, ju I just want you to know really what was behind these numbers. Um, it, it wasn't perfect, but I ran these at least three times and got the same numbers. So I felt fairly confident that these are indicative of vendor performance. So the first thing tested was load times of 42,000 opportunity rows, all right? In green are people who won. So Zimba turned that out in 1 minute and 39 seconds. DBAMP was close behind. If I, I did load time to the link server, I just kicked that off and went and got myself a cup of coffee. Don't recommend that. But, you know, let's test it and see how bad it is. <laughs> it's really what happened there. Um, now let's talk about partial load of uh, 4,500 uh, rows with an insert only, not update. So now my mind started going to incremental load. Okay, my 42,000 could have been a full load. I now have about 4.6 thousand coming through every day that have been modified. Uh, you know, we have to pick something, right? So I have a partial load. I'm not doing an update. I'm still just doing an insert. What happens? Who wins? Progress Zimba, sorted to the top, of course. Although I have to say, Pragmatic Works was 0 0.03 seconds behind. I do not think that's a showstopper. If I do an insert and update, it stands to reason my same vendor sorted, sorted to the top. Um, this number was interesting. And you can see that's why I had a disclaimer. If I just did an insert, I was at 47 seconds. Now with an update, I actually dropped a second. So that tells you that I might have had some locking going on when I tested this particular vendor. Um, but it's close and it still gives you, you know, a general idea. I mean, by George, if you're at 10 minutes and 33 seconds, <laughs> probably not the vendor for you. All right, uh, last, uh, as far as ex execution times, we said, okay, let's do the real mother load here. So I pulled 338,000 task rows, and the question was, who won there? And Zimba, ODBC, sorted to the top again. I want to share with you something I just learned this morning, and I had to put a big smile on, on my face. I've actually been working with Azure Data Factory in Salesforce for the last two months. And I was totally amused to see today that the Azure Data Factory behind the scenes is using Zimba ODBC. So how cool is that? <laughs> I just had a little laugh to myself because it was so funny to see Zimba come up in a log file after I had done all this work and had personally con concluded that they were the best ODBC driver on the market. And here they are also supporting Azure Data Factory. A little side note there for your amazement or amusement. All right, I'm not going to spend time here. I included this slide just for your information should you download it. It uses a different API call. And I'm not going to talk about costs because that's between you and the vendor and everyone's willing to make you a great deal. So that's not my place, but I've given you links to get you started. All right, so some final words about Azure Data Factory. Um, you can also extract data with ADF, okay? There's actually a built-in ADF uh, Salesforce uh, connector. So if you're using ADF or if you're entertaining the idea 
oh, let's talk about that. <laughs> All right, um, because we're talking about extract sound, two different areas. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this uh, because I do see that I have 10 minutes left in this presentation and I wanted to give some time for questions. But I do want to just throw ADF on the table and I'll just give you my unsolicited opinion. I feel that unless your sales force has audaciously large record sets, it is not a candidate for Azure Data Factory. All right? However, if you have a business requirement uh, to have Salesforce data in Azure Data Lake or Blob Storage for consumption by Data Lake Analytics, then Salesforce data could very well be a good candidate for Azure Data Factory if you have a requirement to put it in Azure Data Lake. With that said, Keep in mind that SSIS has an Azure Data Lake source and destination. So you don't have to use Azure Data Factory to get data into the lake. Just saying, okay? <laughs> but it is an option and it is worth talking about. If you decide to use Azure Data Factory, however, to pull Salesforce data, I want you to be aware of a couple things, right? As of today, tomorrow is going to be different. I hear there's a new version of ADF coming out in June, okay? But right now, ADF only copies. So there is no move, delete, or rename capability. All right, a, a little PS to that is yes, you could use a custom .NET activity, but that's not what I'm talking about here. I personally don't want to become a .NET developer. Okay, so there are options. There's also a use SQL, but let's just talk about ADF as it stands today without my having to do any uh, additional programming. It only copies. Um, ADF also does not have any current user parameter capabilities that's coming out in the next version. I will tell you that it is extremely challenging to start a pipeline on demand. You can do it, but there are tips and tricks to that. And if you're working with Asia, if you've just started with ADF, please send me an email. I will send you my ADF rulebook. Um, there are also limited functions in ADF. Right now, there's only date, time, and one single text function. That's not to say that you can't use T-SQL functions in your select clause. I actually tested this the other day. I can select from opportunity replacing using the replace clause. I have replace function, excuse me. And it actually worked in my T-SQL statement inside of ADF. I did not test all the other plethora of T-SQL functions with Salesforce data. I just needed to replace because I, I was having a problem with SSIS. Their Azure Data Factory a source has neglected to put in a text qualifier. All right. Uh, last, you cannot create a file name with ADF to guarantee uniqueness. Um, Keep in mind, pipeline schedules will backfill and overwrite existing Azure, Azure Data Lake files. And ADF also creates empty output files. So I actually have a couple more points about ADF that I'm not going to share because they're probably not applicable to the majority of people on this call. Azure Data Factory is fairly new. Azure Data Lake as well, blob storage. Um, but just know that ADF is certainly an option to you if you're talking about extracting Salesforce data, and it might be very applicable and appropriate. I don't know, but there are just a few things that you need to think about there. So I'm not going to talk about other places of extract and analysis services in Power BI. Notice my, my numbers and my columns. I tend to do a, a BI blueprint, and I think this way pretty much about everything I do in moving data from source to destination. Azure Data Factory was no exception. But I want to talk to you about extract recommendations in the couple minutes that I have left. So whenever you ask a consultant, what should I do, this consultant is first going to look at her Power BI wheel, right, her BI wheel of success, and say, what's best for reporting and analytics? <laughs> <laughs> All right, but when we come to extracting data, pretty much nothing's better for reporting and analytics. It's not about reporting and analytics, right? It often is about cost. All right, and if cost is your critical success point and is the hill you want to die on, then you want to use DBM. Again, I'm not going to give you vendor costs. I'm just saying in my research and experience, DBM was by far the most cost effective. Incredibly 
Look at this, unlimited servers and users, very impressive. Um, but it is a simple methodology. Um, it doesn't require ODBC, but it is just a data extract solution. So I still have to solve my problem of needing an upsert. Okay, so I could say I'm going to buy DBM because it's cheapest, but I'm also going to buy Task Factory because I want an upsert. Cozy Rock also has an upsert, just in all fairness. I don't know how much it is. I know part of Cozy Rock is free. I'll leave that up to you to decide. Um, but basically what I can't do, in my opinion, is just use DBAMP by itself. I'm still going to need that upsert task, and I'm going to, how am I going to get it? But just talking strictly about um, extracts, DBAMP is your best bet for cost. If you want the simplest ETL process and additional SSIS tools, and again, I'm not going to, I want to actually pull something over for you to see. This is SQL Server Integration Services with the use of Task Factory. Here I've used it as my source. Here's my upsert destination. Here I've used a SQL Server database as a source, and look what's happening in here. I'm actually, there you go. I knew you'd come up. <laughs> I'm actually inserting into Salesforce. I'm upserting into Salesforce. I'm doing an update into Salesforce, or I'm deleting Salesforce data right from SQL Server Integration Services. All right? Now I might have purchased Task Factory because I just wanted this one little tool. And Task Factory, by the way, is a, is a whole $1,500 per SSIS server. It's not a deal breaker. Um, hopefully not. Uh, your budget can at least handle that. <laughs> I know for some people, you really had tight budget. So, um, but $1,500 for SSIS server, it's free on developer machines. And you might buy it just for the upsert component. But I'm telling you, you get all these little goodies just because you wanted one component. And a lot of these are really going to be able to help you in your ETL process. All right, this is not a sales pitch. So I'm moving off of that. I just wanted you to see it um, because I love Task Factory even before it could be coming to Pragmatic Works. All right, so that wins to our simplest ETL process and our additional SSIS tools. If I want fastest initial and incremental load times, all right, so performance is it's the most important thing for me, I'm going to get Zimbo ODBC. And ironically, Microsoft came to that same conclusion with, that, with uh, Azure Data Factory. Um, also note, I don't know if this matters to you, but it was the only vendor that did not return data as an NVAR card data type. I don't know if that matters to you, just something to think about. Okay, I will tell you, I loved working with that Zimbo ODBC. It was easy to install, configure, and test. No help desk needed. Plug and play. Away you go. Loved it. There are other vendors that I spent a half a day to a full day to a day and a half just trying to get their ODBC driver to work. It was a little frustrating, but eventually it, it did work. But something I loved about Zimbo, it was really plug and play out of the box. Um, I'll let you read the rest yourself. Um, if what's important to you is that you not be ODBC dependent, and there are lots of reasons not to be ODC dependent, but you want to then look at Task Factory and DBM. Okay? All right, so I have come to the end of my presentation. I have three minutes left for questions. I can't read the questions, though, um, so I actually need you to give them to me. I can go ahead and read them to you, and there's only a few here. Um, okay. The first question is, what tool do you recommend to use to load data into SQL Server? From Salesforce? I assume that's what the question is. And again, I would go back to what's most important to you. If I was going to buy one, I of course would buy Task Factory because I just personally like it. But let's step back for just a minute. What's most important to you? I'm sorry, I'm having to piecemeal mode this back here. You know, let's look at this performance chart. If incremental and load times are the most important thing to you, then you want to go with ODBC. But ODBC comes at a price. Okay, the 64-bit is only allows a user DSN. That can be a security problem. All right, so you need to think about that. If you're willing to pay for a little bit of time and get the benefits of an SSIS component, I'm I'm going to you want to go with Task Factory hands down. So Task Factory is always my default, but I am partial to it, in all honesty. Okay, next question. 
All right, next question is, what is uncluttered GUI in context of the critical success factors? The actual end user tool, e.g., um, for example, uh, SSRS or Tableau. Okay, so an uncluttered graphical user interface, what I'm talking about here is what I present to my user, and I have a Power BI example up, but with reporting services that would not be applicable, okay, because reporting services are not really, well, in 2016, you can do some self-service and expose this, but in SSRS, you're actually exposing data sets that you've already pulled off of your multi-dimensional cube, tabular model, or views. Um, so let's just talk about Power BI, since that's like the, the greatest thing. As you can see here, this is an actual Salesforce report. I don't feel that this is an uncluttered graphical user interface because I have gazillions tables and facts and dimensions. And Power BI by design puts my dimensions and facts together, which is just something I need to get used to. But there's too many things going on here. If you are working with multi-dimensional cubes, Microsoft will tell you that you need to tap out at about 20 dimensions and X number of facts, right? They do put a limitation for best user experience. And all I'm saying here is when you don't have a good semantic layer, okay, and you don't have a data model optimized for analytics, which is what's happening on this particular report, you have a very cluttered user experience. And I personally don't like that. I feel it needs to be one of our return on investments and part of our planning of our BI Blueprint. That's what I meant by that. Anything else, ma'am? All right, one more question to wrap it up. What is the best place to implement the data model? Is it in Power BI or SSAS tabular model? Also, what are the advantages and disadvantages with both methods? Okay, so I'm going to jump out of presenter mode in a moment so I can just go to a slide if you all don't mind. All right, so what you're asking me about, or I, I'm interpreting what you're asking me about is, is here. So where does my data model belong? Pardon me, my computer always does this backwards. Okay, so where does my data model belong? In my opinion, your data model belongs in column 7. It is consumed by SSAS, and then your reports ideally would just consume your tabular model or multidimensional cube. All right, I am not a proponent of modeling and transforming data, either in my data source view and analysis services or in the back part of my Power BI. And the reason I feel so strongly about that is, an, is I'm not trying to be a pill, um, but what I am trying to avoid, and I'm trying to get back to my Power BI report, is when you do data transforms and you do data modeling in Power BI, you get this gigantuous mess. And all I'm asking you is, do you feel this is scalable? Because every PBIX file has this in it, right? I don't want to replicate this over and over again in every Power BI report. I want to have a semantic model that has all this figured out and all my relationships and all my DACs and all and people are consuming uh, and I've done my work once basically. But if you take out eight or if you take out seven, that's what your Power BI works looks like and I am just strongly recommending against it. Anything else ma'am? All right. Well, we are actually, um, it's a little bit past noon, so I'm going to go ahead and wrap up here. Thank you so much to Laura um, for the wonderful presentation today. And thank you everyone for joining us for today's webinar. As always, all of our webinars are recorded and we will be sending a follow-up email with a link to the full recording to all registrants tomorrow. Um, please join us every Tuesday for free training and view our upcoming webinars on pragmaticworks.com under free training.